Hello everybody! Are you guys there? Today is my first day in pulmonary hypertension clinic and I'm really nervous. Let's quickly go over what we know about its definition, classification, pathophysiology, and some of the echo findings, okay? Hang around with me, I'll be thinking out loud with y'all. Let's start with the definition. Pulmonary hypertension is defined as a hemodynamic and pathophysiological condition characterized by an increase in mean pulmonary arterial pressure to more than 20 millimeters of mercury at rest as measured by right heart catheterization according to the most recent ACCP guidelines. Let's spend some time talking about the classification of pulmonary hypertension. In the most recent classification, pulmonary hypertension is classified into five groups. Group 1 is pulmonary arterial hypertension, which can be hereditary, idiopathic, associated with conditions such as connective tissue disease, HIV, portopulmonary hypertension, congenital heart disease, and schistosomiasis. Drugs and toxin exposures are also classified under this category, as well as persistent pulmonary hypertension of newborn. Group 2 includes pulmonary hypertension due to left heart disease, which includes both diastolic and systolic dysfunction, valvular heart diseases, along with congenital cardiomyopathies. Group 3 includes pulmonary hypertension from lung disease and hypoxia, such as interstitial lung disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, LAM, obstructive sleep apnea, alveolar hypoventilation disorders, and chronic exposure to altitude. Group 4 is chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension and other pulmonary artery obstructive disorders, such as tumors, parasites, and arthritis. Group 5 is made up of pulmonary hypertension with unclear etiologies, such as hemolytic anemias, sarcoidosis, metabolic disorders, and chronic renal failure, amongst others. Now let's all take a deep breath and think about the pathophysiology of pulmonary hypertension. Oh. As you can see from this graph, pulmonary circulation is a low resistance and highly compliant system as opposed to the systemic circulation. With the increase in cardiac output, the lungs are able to recruit partially collapsed or unused vessels, decreasing the pulmonary vascular resistance. There is also a low degree of vascular tone in the proximal pulmonary vascular bed, again decreasing the pulmonary vascular resistance. The right ventricle is more compliant than the left ventricle and adapts better to volume loading than to pressure loading. The ventricles demonstrate ventricular interdependence that is shown in the figure. Normally, the pressure in the left ventricular cavity causes the septum to bulge towards the right. In pulmonary hypertension, however, the increased right-sided pressures flatten the septum in systole, and eventually the septum can bulge into the left, decreasing the left ventricular systole and diastolic dysfunction in severe pulmonary hypertension. This flowchart shows how chronic pressure loading leads to right ventricular hypertrophy, leading to right ventricular dilation, systolic dysfunction, low cardiac output, and eventually right heart failure. The right ventricular dilation also leads to tricuspid annular dilation, leading to tricuspid regurgitation, and eventually resulting in impaired right ventricular filling and intraventricular septal deviation. The systolic dysfunction along with the chronic pressure loading also lead to tricuspid regurgitation eventually and therefore lead to impaired right ventricular filling and intraventricular septal deviation. Patients with suspected pulmonary hypertension must be evaluated with a series of investigation ranging from thorough clinical evaluations through non-invasive imaging techniques to right heart cath, which is considered to be the gold standard for diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension. Guidelines recommend that a detailed echocardiographic assessment should be performed in all patients with suspected pulmonary hypertension. Let's quickly review the echocardiographic parameters to diagnose pulmonary hypertension. This shows the parasternal long axis view. You can see the right ventricle, left ventricle, 
left atrium, the aorta, as well as the intraventricular septum. In this view, we can measure the right ventricular hypertrophy that occurs with chronic pressure loading. We can also view any interventricular septal deviation or thickening. The moderator band is also seen on the echocardiographic view on the right. This is the right ventricular inflow tract in the long axis view. Here you can visualize the right ventricle and the right atrium. The tricuspid valvular apparatus is also seen. This view allows us to visualize the tricuspid velocity and also provides an assessment of the right ventricular systolic function. Tricuspid velocity is the difference in the pressure between the right ventricle and the right atrium. When pulmonary stenosis is absent, the right ventricular systolic pressure is assumed to be equal to the systolic artery pressure and can be calculated using the Bernoulli's equation using the estimated right atrial pressure from the inferior vena cava diameter as shown in the next screen. Here we show how the inferior vena cava's diameter is measured at rest and during inspiration to provide an estimate of the right atrial pressure. Here we see the right ventricular outflow tract in the long axis with the aortic valve and the pulmonary artery. Right ventricular outflow tract is used to assess the main pulmonary artery, which can be dilated in pulmonary hypertension in relation to the adjacent aorta. Also, the pulmonary valve apparatus can be visualized. These images show the parasternal short axis view with the right and the left ventricle. The intraventricular septum is visualized between them. The left ventricle is normally circular in shape and larger than the right ventricle. In this view, we can see the ventricular interdependence. High pressures in the right ventricle push the septum towards the left ventricle, compromising its diastolic and systolic function. Note the D-shaped left ventricle and the dilated right ventricle. Next is the apical four-chamber view. Here we can see the left atrium and the ventricle, the right atrium and the right ventricle. A number of parameters can be assessed in this view, including right ventricular dilation and hypertrophy with wall thickness of more than 5 mm, systolic function, tricuspid valve structure, and tricuspid velocity. Here you can see the right ventricle being dilated with tricuspid regurgitation. Also note the prominent moderator band, which is the first element to hypertrophy in pulmonary hypertension. Also measured from this view is the tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion, also known as TAPSI. This is the reflection of movement of the base of the right ventricle to the apex. A TAPSI of more than 15 mm is considered abnormal. It is a prognostic indicator in pulmonary arterial hypertension for disease severity and response to therapy. Lastly, we are going to look at the subcostal view. In this view, you can see the right atrium, the right ventricle, the left atrium, and the left ventricle, and the interventricular septum. This view allows us to measure the degree of right ventricular dysfunction and thickness of the right ventricular wall, abnormal being more than 5 millimeters. It provides the best measure of inferior right ventricular wall thickness. Also, a reminder that the inferior vena cava is measured here at rest and during inspiration to estimate the right atrial pressures. Okay guys, I think I feel prepared for clinic now. Hope you guys are too. Thanks for listening. Until next time, signing off.
Toodles.